I'm going to be starting a new uh, series next week, and uh, this message could actually tie in with that, but we'll let that be the official kickoff. And uh, for several weeks, we're going to talk about God's most wanted. And there are things specifically that God wants, and uh, God doesn't need anything. He's God. But there are things that he wants. And so we're going to talk about the specific things that Scripture declares for us or that God speaks that he wants and the uniqueness of that that we can incorporate into our life or that we can uh, help provide for that. So that's kicking off next week and uh, looking forward to a great time with that. But today I want to uh, speak a message that the Lord really uh, spoke to me uh, specifically. And when I say that, I mean exactly that. I was uh, praying about, um, really, last week, Kim, as we tag-teamed together on the Mother's Day message, she did fantastic. Uh, I think her half was better than my half, but nonetheless, as a team, we, we came together, amen? And uh, she shared, uh, a, really, a prophetic word picture that the Lord showed her. And if you weren't here, it was simply about... Uh, a record player, a vinyl record player, and how sometimes the, the needle will get stuck and it'll just keep repeating that same segment there because it's scratched or whatever. And the specific word was that um, sometimes we can just uh, blow on that uh, record and there's a piece of lint or something that's there and it'll free that and it'll go on. And other times we can uh, put uh, some uh, added weight on that needle to, to hold it in place. And back in the day, uh, before digital, uh, we, would, we had a, another use for pennies and nickels, and that was to put on vinyl records. If the needle got stuck, we could weight it down a little bit. So you could tape a, a coin on there to be just enough weight to pull that through. And then at other times, none of those first two would work, and, and you had to resort to picking up the needle and moving it over slightly so that it got out of that groove and, and went on. And <clears throat> she shared that, which is, is an incredible word picture in itself, but she, she said she felt like the Lord was sharing that with her, showing that to her for, to share with our body, that... that there were people who were stuck in a specific place and sometimes there's just some lint or junk or dirt that, that gets in that blocks us from moving forward or moving on across and completing the, the song that God has us in, if you will. And at other times that, that, there's, that God wants to put his hand on us and, and just a little extra weight to, to help carry us through those times when we're stuck. And then at other times, God wants to just literally reach down and lift us up and, and put us in a different place and give us a fresh start. And I was thinking about that, <clears throat> thinking about uh, people not just in our body, but that we're connected with and familiar with and, and people that are struggling with things that they've struggled with for a long time. And sometimes... They, they get free, but then they go back to that place. And, and so I was asking the Lord, why do people struggle w with things? And even as born again, spirit filled believers in the Lord Jesus with the power of his word and those kinds of things. And I was thinking back even in the past of people that we've counseled and ministered to and, and poured into, and then they'll, they'll, go for a while and then they either go back to the place they were or sometimes worse. And even Paul in the scripture says that that bothered him deeply. He said, who is weak and I don't feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? And it wasn't a, a judgment, it was a concern for them. And so as I was just going about, I was actually in the shower uh, praying and, and I just asked the Lord, Lord, why is that? Why do people stay stuck? And it was immediate and so definitive 
his answer to me. And he just said, because of no repentance, no genuine repentance. And I said, what do you mean? And he immediately took me to a passage of scripture that I've used uh, for years in counseling situations to help people see that this process that God wants to bring in our life. And that scripture is in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. And it says this, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. So this morning, I want to talk about the power of repentance, but from this context, how to live a life of no regret, how to live a life of no regret. Now, if you'll just think for a moment about the things in your life that you may regret, mistakes that you've made or whatever, it's not necessarily the mistake, it's the the consequences, it's the effects, it's... It's what happens with that. More specifically, it's not necessarily the mistake. It's your response after you've made the mistake. Several years ago, we preached a series of messages called uh, on the fear of the Lord. And I defined the fear of the Lord as this. People who fear God are not perfect, but they're quick to repent and swift to obey. The the fear of the Lord is not living in this perfection or being afraid of God necessarily. It's being afraid in in a positive sense, in a constructive sense of missing or disconnecting from that relationship with God. Or in other words, it's being afraid of displeasing God. Not because he's mean, not because he's this taskmaster, he's a father. And so the thing that guides a life of, in the fear of the Lord is a sense of honor, that we want to bring honor to God, that, that we want to honor him with the life that he's given us and the freedom that we have in him. And so as we walk out that process, here Paul addresses it very specifically, and he says that, that this sense of godly sorrow brings us to a place of repentance, And then it says that that repentance, which literally is a turning away or returning to God. The Greek word is metanoeo. And it literally means a total change of mind and heart. It's it's to do 180. It's a reverse of, of where we're going. It's turning away from one thing and turning to God. But notice he says this. Godly sorrow is what initiates that process, godly sorrow. And then at the end, he says, but worldly sorrow brings death. So I wanna talk about that process for a minute because I think that's where people get stuck. The, The common denominator is sorrow, but what makes it godly sorrow and what makes it worldly sorrow? It's how we respond to it. The sorrow feels the same way, it's sadness. We're, we're sad about a situation. In this case, um, Paul had written them a letter, and, and it's 1 Corinthians. And the letter of 1 Corinthians, Paul has some very frank, direct words that are kind, but very straightforward. He rebukes them for their lack of unity, for divisions in their church for sexual immorality that is tolerated among them and and not just uh, uh, slight things. He said, even the pagans don't tolerate the stuff that you tolerate. And he says, when it came to uh, talking about communion and them coming to receive the Lord, he said, I have no praise for you. Your meetings do more harm than good. That's, That's kind of a harsh statement. And so he, he writes to bring this sense of correction out of a heart of love for them, and it hurt their feelings. That, that's that's the, the, the sense of sorrow. And whether or not it was godly sorrow or whether it was worldly sorrow determined how they responded. 
And so here it is, his second letter to them. He's following up and he says to them, I see that my letter hurt you, but I'm not sorry for that. I, I was at first because I saw that I hurt your feelings, but, but now I rejoice because of what it produced in you. And so he says this verse 10, then godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. So, so the difference here is that godly sorrow is oriented toward God. Godly sorrow makes us sorry for our sin, but it turns our hearts toward the Lord and what he desires. Worldly sorrow is the focus of that is us. And really the, the, the focus of worldly sorrow it gets off track because it gets focused on what we'll lose. And it's usually focused on stuff. What I'm going to lose in that, the, the pleasure from this or whatever it is that, that it, it, it severs relationship and causes this destruction in our life. So he said, there's not a difference between the sorrow. It's how we respond to it. That when we take our sorrow and we bring it to God, rather than having our sorrow uh, bring uh, condemnation, godly sorrow, here's a simple way to define it, produces conviction in our heart, a determination that, man, I'm going to do something about this. Worldly sorrow brings condemnation, that, that we're a bad person, that we've done something wrong, and that we deserve to be punished. When Darren was talking earlier about uh, loving God and hating evil, that, that sense of sorrow that comes when we realize that there are things in our life, it, godly sorrow leads us to repentance and recognizing, wait a minute, this isn't you, this isn't what I uh, desired. And so, Lord, I repent of this. I turn away from it and I turn back to you. It brings salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow puts the focus on us and it's not hating evil. Instead, it's turning and hating ourselves. Hating what we do, hating who we are. Worldly sorrow is the root of shame. Which keeps us trapped in that cycle of being bad people and doing bad things. And God's not fair. God's not just. Uh, th this, this isn't right. And I shouldn't be punished for this. And it finds excuses and ways of escape instead of taking responsibility and embracing that in the Lord and then moving us forward. Is this making sense? Okay, so the key, what I want you to get this morning, the key to a life, living a life of no regrets is genuine repentance. It's experiencing sorrow. We're all going to experience sorrow in our life. How we respond to that and taking it to God and dealing with the mistakes that we make and dealing with the temptations that come our way and dealing with our decisions and dealing with the, the fallout from those relationally, financially, legally, or however, determines whether we'll live and walk in life or whether we'll walk in death. That, that all worldly sorrow produces death. And through the years in counseling situations and talking with people, they, they come and sometimes I, I've talked to men in situations that are at the point of tears, literally. Weeping over a sin that's been committed or a mistake in their life or all of that. And usually when they realize the consequences or how devastating it is in their marriage or uh, publicly or sometimes it's a legal situation that they're, they're in trouble. And their response to that determines when we come back to this and say, okay, whether or not it's good to be sorry, but you can be sorry that you got caught and still not be sorry that you sinned. Hey, let that settle in. Because worldly sorrow is I'm sorry for my sin, which means I'm sorry that I got caught. 
which leads us to cover it up, which leads us to run from God, which leads us to run away from situations and responsibilities rather than coming back to God. That's uh, what Isaiah prophesied, that God's heart was to restore them and to redeem them, but they said, God, your ways are not just, that, that you punish us for our sins and, and turn away from us. And God said, I don't want to turn away from you. I want you to turn to me. And so Isaiah prophesied, thus saith the Lord, the word of the Lord, um, that in repentance and rest is your salvation, in quietness and confidence is your trust. And then he added these words, but you would have none of it. You said, no, we will flee. We will run on horses away from this. And so the Lord said, your pursuers will run faster than you. And that sense of fear or trying to run away from your responsibilities will cause one person to put many of you to flight, five of you to put hundreds of you to flight, because now there's a spirit of fear and rejection working in your life rather than a spirit of genuine repentance. God's heart, God's desire was that they would repent. The prophet Jeremiah also declared that. That, that the Lord said, you know, you're not cut off, that my heart of compassion and love for you is reaching to you. And so God re- told them, how do we respond to this? God said, repent and live. Turn to somebody and just tell them, repent and live. See, we, sin- we have a s- tendency or a sense in our life that repentance is a negative word. And for some of us, it kind of has uh, religious connotations and a negative sense, you know, legalistic and, and whatever. And, and, but what we realize is that, or what I realize is that people who struggle in a consistent relationship with God, experiencing his life, walking through, or people who struggle to develop a very meaningful prayer life, which requires intimacy with God, vulnerability, openness, Instead of coming to God, telling him your agenda, effective prayer is finding a quiet place and asking God, what's his agenda? What's on your heart? Father, what would you want of me today? I just want to be with you. And I just want to sit here and, and be in your presence. And somebody say, well, that's not prayer. Well, prayer is not a, a monologue. It's a dialogue. Prayer's not you telling God about your needs. Prayer is you connecting in your heart with the Father's heart, and then you realize he already knows what you need. And he says, ask of me, and I'll give you the nations. Ask, you don't have because you don't ask, but that's not the only side of prayer. It's really getting the Father's heart and then praying his word back to him in that atmosphere where it becomes this powerful thing that God uses to direct our hearts and lives back to him. And when we realize that there are things in our life that aren't pleasing to God, it should make us sad. That it should produce sorrow in our lives. But when we're so oriented on getting our needs met and what we need is to be happy, Rather than, as we talked about last week, finding joy in the journey. Joy is not just about temporary happiness. Joy is about a long-term perspective of finding that in the Lord and what he's doing in our life. Is anybody hearing me this morning? But if my fo- the focus of my heart gets reduced down to what's going to make me happy, then I'm going to try to avoid all the things that make me sad. And if God is trying to work in my heart and bring genuine conviction of an area and let me know that that's not pleasing to him, it's not because he's saying, you're not pleasing to me. He's saying, here's something that you can work on, that you can bring to me, that you can open to me so that we can be closer. Because what's making us separated is not me, it's you. And so the Lord uses this process to bring godly sorrow into our life to to bring us to a place of repentance, of turning or returning to him, of a total change of heart and mind. It literally means to think differently afterwards. 
And when Jesus began to, uh, after his time in the wilderness and the temptation, where he faced down the enemy and then began his ministry, Matthew uh, chapter 4, in fact, several of the Gospels declare, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. The, the, the process of repentance, of turning to God, thinking differently about our lives, feeling things on a different plane or different level is because the kingdom of God is here. And the process of repentance, the meta part of the definition for repent is a, is a strategic big picture perspective. When it's talking about thinking differently about our lives or about our sin or about those areas in our life, it, it's not what's okay. It's not comparing that sin to somebody else's sin. It's not comparing our life and saying, well, what I did was bad. It's not as bad as Adam Kelly. So, so Lord, me and you okay today or, or whoever the comparison is. I'm not picking on you, Adam. Amen. Are you with me here this morning? See, because it's easy for us to get in that place and then make excuses for our lives and for our sin because what we feel is sorrow. Okay, and that godly sorrow, God wants to direct in him to this point of repentance, which is a wonderful thing, a positive thing, turning back to him, changing our heart, changing our mind about the thing that God is working in us that brings salvation. Now, that's not just the, the spiritual sense, uh, which it, it is that, but it, it's the the literal sense, the salvaging of relationships, marriages, life, finances, whatever it may be that sin has triggered that produced the sorrow that, that now we're trapped and what do I do with it? I'm feeling the sorrow, godly sorrow, worldly sorrow feels the same. The sadness impacts us and begins to envelop us. And then what are we going to do with it? Are we going to bring it to God so that it can be godly sorrow, that it will lead us to a total change of heart and mind, repentance, that will bring salvation. And then at this point where we realize what God has salvaged, what God has restored, what God has fixed in our life, what God has saved us from and forgiven us from, we'll leave no regret. So the question again, how do we live a life of no regrets? That we respond when sorrow begins to work in our life in a godly way that brings us to this place of repentance, brings us to salvation, leaves no regret. If we don't, if, we, if it's worldly sorrow, it, when we look at that and compare it with others or bring it back to God or make excuses or look at the, the things that we're going to have to give up and we found such pleasure in this or whatever, it's met a need in my life and now how am I going to make it without it? And then fear begins to take over. Worldly sorrow brings death. Godly sorrow triggers this process of life in us that brings us back to God. And repentance is the key. Are you seeing it? Okay, let me give you a couple of scriptures and, and then, in fact, let me go back and, and read uh, two different versions of 2 Corinthians 10. Godly sorrow leads to repentance that brings salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Here's from the New Living Translation. For the kind of sorrow that God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. Leads us away. Notice the turning, the, the repentance. Leads us away from sin, returns, results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Wow. Here's from the message translation. Distress that drives us to God does that. 
it turns us around. It puts us back in the way of salvation. We never regret that kind of pain. But those who let distress drive them away from God are full of regrets and they end up on a deathbed of regrets. God doesn't want us to end up on a deathbed of regrets. That if we do end up on a deathbed and realize the days or numbers of days of our life are quickly coming to an end for whatever reason, he doesn't want that to be a time of regret. God doesn't measure our life by the number of days in it. God measures our life by the amount of life in whatever number of days we have. And when we're walking in him, God fills every one of our days with abundant life. It's not that we don't have problems. It's not that we don't have struggles. It's this process where we realize that it triggers our heart to turn back to God. It's that mechanism of saying, wait a minute, sometimes we, we get drawn into temptation. Sometimes it's the, the, the lust of our eyes, uh, the lust of our flesh, or the pride of life, as James defines it. Other times, it's the reality where sin springs on us. It's like a trap that the enemy sets. It's not that we planned for it. It wasn't premeditated and we find ourselves there. And then how can we respond? How, what do we do? How do we get out of it? And the key uh, in that whole process of dealing with uh, at the end of our life, having no regrets, as well as we go through life, when we realize situations like Paul did, that we hurt other people's feelings. Now, this was deep enough that Paul would address it and it's important enough that God would record it for us in scripture so that we could realize even in church, we can make mistakes. And even in church, that, that depth of sorrow goes to a point where it can separate relationships, but God can bring it back together if we respond to him in the right way, the godly sorrow. Now listen, here it says um, several scriptures on, on repentance. I mentioned to you Ezekiel 18 and Matthew 4. Uh, here's Acts 2.38. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, when they ask him, what does this mean? This outpouring, this, this chaos, this commotion, these people declaring the wonders of God in languages that we uh, uh, understand, but we know they don't know those languages. What does all that mean? The people were cut to their heart and asked him, what does this mean? What should we do? Here's what Peter replied, Acts 2.38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, your children, and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. First thing I want you to get is this. Repentance takes us from living under the penalty of sin to living under the power of the promise of God, the Holy Spirit. They ask him, what does this mean? What shall we do? And the first thing that Peter said to them was repent. Turn, have a total change of heart and mind. Turn to God, godly sorrow. They were struck in their heart. They were cut in their heart. It's another way to define that. God brought conviction on their lives. And Peter's response to them, the first thing we do is repent, not the last. The first thing, repent, turn to God, and that you will receive the promise of, of, or the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off. Repentance takes us from living under the penalty of sin, the burden, the weight, how it, it pushes us down and, and instead brings us into this place in God where we begin to live under the power of the promise. Here's another one, Acts chapter three, verse 19. Again, the scripture declares, repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, 
and times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. I love that verse. And it begins with repentance. And then it says, so that your sins might be wiped out. The scripture says, whoever uh, conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. The process of repentance is bringing our sins to God and opening our hearts to the Lord and saying, Father, I realize that here where I am. And so I'm opening this to you. I'm turning away from it. I'm turning to you. And then the Lord meets us in that place and it's a powerful thing. Here's the second thing about repentance. Repentance takes us from regret to refreshing in the Lord. It's that process of turning to what we're going to regret eventually and probably already do. You know, we we can enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, but it's a real short season. Because it comes with this sense of what we have to do emotionally and in our actions to, to try to cover that, to stay in that place when God begins to work in our hearts. The only way to deal with the sorrow that sin brings into our life without it affecting us is to harden our hearts so that we don't feel it anymore, which is a huge mistake. And the more we harden our hearts to, to God, the more we harden our hearts in relationship to people and the very thing that, that the enemy deceived us to bring pleasure through sin at whatever level now doesn't bring us pleasure anymore. And if that was money, then there's not enough money to keep the pleasure going because we realize what it's costing us. If that's a relationship outside of a marriage, if that's power or whatever the world has to offer, worldly sorrow always brings death. But God brings sorrow into our heart to turn us to trigger repentance, to come to him that brings salvation and leaves no regret. That's the kind of life I want to live. How about you? Here's the third thing I want you to see about repentance. In Isaiah chapter 30, I mentioned that before, it says, in repentance and rest is your salvation, in quietness and trust is your strength, but you would have none of it. Instead, they wanted to run away. They wanted to flee on horses. Repentance turns us from running away from our problems or sins to resting in the Lord's grace in our problems. God said, I want to have grace. I want to pour my compassion out upon you in repentance and rest is your salvation, but you wouldn't have it. They they had told the Lord that his ways weren't just. In other words, they said to God, this isn't fair that I'm in this situation. This isn't fair that, that you say this is wrong when it feels so right. They use all the excuses that we use today. We've just refined them a little bit for our culture. Waiting for one amen. Thank you, Miss Susan. Okay. Are you with me here? Is this okay that I pastor you a little bit this morning? I'm doing it with compassion. I'm not pointing fingers. And we're not going to have repent, you foul, evil things. What we are going to do is see how positive it is when our hearts turn to God. And how he's waiting for us to do that. And how so many times if we'll look honestly... And truthfully, it's situations in our life where we stay stuck. Or it's situations in our life that produce regret. At decisions in our life that we made in the feelings of a moment that now bring deep regret, what do we do? We can either live with regret beneath the promise of God, or we can understand that even through repentance, God can bring restoration, and we can be in a place where it leaves no regret. How many want to deal with regret in your life and live a life of no regrets? Anybody joining me this morning? Okay, here's, here's what we're going to do. Let's finish this up so we can pray. Uh, the, the third thing about repentance, it turns us from running away from our problems. Okay? And there are people all over the world trying to run away from their problems. And what they find is that as soon as they stop to take a breath, their problems catch up with them. 
They can't run fast enough. They can't run from all the people. They can't run from whatever, the mistakes. They can't run from the penalty. They can't run from the law. They can't run from those things far enough because really the, the, the problem isn't something on the outside. The problem's always something on the inside and you take it with you when you go. You, you can try to avoid it, but, but you get in a situation like the, uh, what's the movie, Hidalgo, where, where the guy was a, a got in these long distance horse races and uh they they finally confront him on how, why he's living his life the way he is and and they say you know we call you long rider because you you uh are are far you're disconnected from your heart and you're trying to ride far from it but you can't and I think a lot of people are in those situations. Here is the uh, last part of that. Back to 2 Corinthians 7. Paul writes, uh, I think it's in verse 8, and says, uh, I caused you uh, sorrow by my letter. Let me get it right here so you can see it. Yes. Verse 8, he says, even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed by us in any way. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Now watch what he says. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. Okay, Because they responded rightly and turned to God, the godly sorrow brought repentance that led to salvation and then this place of leaving no regret. Not, no regret for Paul in having to be the one that brought the word of correction that hurt them and then the separation of relationship that was there that they worked hard to restore, that God restored. And so now Paul's responding to that in saying, see what this godly sorrow has produced in you. How do we know the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow? Because of what it produces. It's oriented toward God or it's oriented toward the world. How can we tell? The, the, the key to us really working godly sorrow in our life is the decisions that we make, the responsibility that we're willing to take for the consequences. I counseled a man years ago and uh, was deeply broken over some things in his life and some decisions that he made that had really destroyed his marriage and his wife, certainly covenant. And, and publicly uh, embarrassed him, and there were some legal issues surrounding it. His business was on the line. And it was interesting to see how deeply he was broken, and uh, he wanted to meet uh, privately uh, at a restaurant uh, back in a corner rather than my office. And as we're talking through, he began to share all this deep regret and so I just asked him, not only was he sorry for his sin, and it was just, oh man, I want this to work, I really do. And, and so I said, well, here's the real question. Then are you willing to take responsibility for the consequences? And he said, well, well what do you mean? And I said, well, there's some legal issues here that, that are involved with this. And he said, well, I've already talked to an attorney, and, and because of the way they've uh, handled this, uh, you know, I, 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 can, I can get out of it. I said, that's not the question. Whether you can get out of it, did you do this? Well, well, yes. So I said, so you really are guilty of these things, but you just don't want to face the guilt. So I said, if it came down to you, walking through this situation and godly sorrow really working, that's accepting those consequences and genuine repentance would be 
that you would plead guilty to these charges and that you'd face the consequences, whatever that might be. He said, but you don't understand. I could go to jail. I, I could lose everything. I could lose my business. I could lose my reputation. And immediately started talking about all the things he could lose. And I said, what you've just described to me is the effects of worldly sorrow. That it's bringing death. That you're not willing to genuinely repent to your wife, to your church family. He wasn't a member of our church, by the way. To others in the, the community that, that you've wronged. So you really don't want to take responsibility for your sin. You just want to get out of it. And because you could cover this and because uh, an attorney or whatever could, could get you off the charges, is that really going to heal your heart? Is that really going to put your marriage back together? See, because someone says you're not guilty does not make you innocent. That when we bring our hearts to God and, and we're in that situation and we realize what we've done and genuine repentance works powerfully in us and deeply in us. Watch how Paul describes it. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing for relationship, what concern about other people, what readiness to see justice done, at every point, you've proved yourselves innocent in this matter. Now, Paul is just talking about sin. So he doesn't mean innocent from sin. What he means is you've proved yourselves innocent of getting into worldly sorrow and trying to fix the thing. You've proved yourselves innocent in the sense that you responded in a godly way with deep concern, with longing, with readiness to see justice. And in other words, taking responsibility and that all the things Paul addressed with them and in relationships and, and in the situations that have brought such devastation into their lives and into their church is the situation where they took responsibility for it and now God's working the whole thing out. At every point, you've proven yourselves innocent. Verse 12, so even though I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did wrong or of the injured party. In other words, Paul said, I didn't get in the middle of a fight and say, and take sides. What I wrote to you was rather that before God, you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. And by all of this, we are encouraged. What was he saying? This is about relationship. This is about the long-term deal. Paul is the one who helped plant the church, establish the church in Corinth. And so he had a heart for them. Even though he wasn't there consistently pastoring it, he had a heart for them and he wanted them to have a heart for him. In fact, he starts that, this chapter by saying, listen, open your hearts to us. And then he said, we haven't wronged anyone. We haven't hurt anyone. And then he goes through the process of saying, man, I was so encouraged by, and so refreshed by uh, Titus in his visit, who, who was a pastor, not necessarily in Corinth. But Paul said he brought word and, and not only did he bring word of how the church was doing, he, he, brought, he refreshed Paul's heart personally and then started talking about how they had a longing for him and that they, they had repented and they realized what, that his words hurt them, but they, they didn't just take offense with Paul. They didn't ostracize him. They didn't talk about how mean he was, how difficult he was, how hard of a preacher that he was, that, that they realized, man, we, we were way off track. We had some sin working in our lives that needed to be addressed. And so when they turned to God and repented, it brought this salvaging of the relationship and the church, and the witness for Christ, and this tremendous opportunity to share the gospel and to live it in a way that it affects our culture. Corinth was the city that had become synonymous with sin and lasciviousness. In fact, so much so, it, it was kind of like the, the Vegas of our day. You know what, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? Why? Because most of what happens in Vegas 
and good. And so in their day, it was the, the synonymous term with to sin was to Corinthianize. It's not, I'm going to go out and, and sin. I'm just going to go out and Corinthianize a little bit. I'm just going to live on the dark side. And, and so Paul planted a church right there. And then some of the aspects in the church weren't any different than the world. And they were trying to work it out. And it needed a, the, the difference in all of that was when they came to this place of genuine repentance. And they began to live a life without regrets. And so he said, I don't regret the fact that we walked through some difficult things. That your hearts were hurt. That you wanted to just pull back, but you didn't. And I don't regret writing the letter, though I did, because I saw what it did. You ever been in a situation like that? You had to be the one to say something to somebody, and you know it hurt them. You know it devastated them. You know what it meant to them. You saw the shock on their face or the, the whole impact of, of your words, and you hated it. How about if you're not the one responsible for it? And you just have to be the one to bring the news. See, Paul wasn't, wasn't the one here that started the fight. Paul was the one addressing the situations that were causing sin to be rampant among them. And they were not only tolerating it, that the, the, the people in the world were pointing fingers at the church and saying, man, we're not that bad. We're pagans and we don't do that stuff. That's crazy. And then the selfishness that had consumed their life, that their whole focus had become worldly. And if that was the source of their sorrow, it would have only brought death. If they would have blamed Paul or blamed anybody else, but they didn't blame, they took responsibility and in repentance, their hearts turned back to God and in turning back to God, turned back to Paul because of that relationship. Can you say amen? Do you see areas of your life where sorrow has come in? God wanted it to be conviction, but we responded inappropriately. We responded wrong. Anything that causes us to regret or to hide or to turn from God or to try to run away rather than to repent and take those things and our problems and our situations and run to God with them, not away from him in them. Repentance is that turning of our hearts, our minds, our thoughts back toward the Lord so that regret isn't consuming our life and relationships aren't being devastated. Instead, we're doing the very thing that it takes to rebuild them to reestablish them. And that's the last part of what Paul says that was so wonderful for him is that the relationship was restored. Their hearts were being healed. They had genuinely repented. That, that they took their sorrow and turned it to God rather than just a bunch of hurt feelings and the pettiness and caused that to separate the relationships and blame one another. You know, another good church fight. And instead, their hearts, they were genuinely convicted. And with the earnestness and the eagerness to make it right, to clear themselves, not defend themselves, but to clear it up. Look, what can I do to make this right? You know, coming and, and honestly owning it and saying, you know what? What you said hurt me, but you were right. That takes tremendous humility. And it takes just as much humility on Paul's side to be the bearer of bad news and to confront somebody in their sin and realize that what, part of what you have to do is bear that offense. You're not the one. That, that is that the, the offense is the sin. But in dealing with that and that sense of sorrow that comes over people's life that God wants to use as conviction, the enemy wants to use as condemnation, Sometimes that's a point of confusion. Anybody ever been there? And that you're feeling this overwhelming sadness about the situation and where you are. And then you got relational dynamics and you got the, the embarrassment of the sin. And you got, okay, well, how do I handle that? And what can I do to make it right? And in the midst of that, the, the enemy is the author of confusion, not God. 
And what God wants us to do is to take that sorrow and turn back to him and then turn to his word. And it's very clear. It is very practical it, 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 that God speaks that word of hope and life to us so that we can see, oh man, that sometimes is what brings the alarm like the Corinthians experienced. And we realize, what have I done? And so rather than go back into hiding and run from God, it's that place, <clears throat> excuse me, where our hearts and our life turn to him and that hope is restored. Excuse me. And our, and our lives are, are saved. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Because when we work through it, those relationships become stronger. God says, as he sent the word of the prophet in, uh, I believe it's Jeremiah's uh, prophecy, excuse me, Ezekiel chapter 18, Ezekiel prophesied these words. Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the sovereign Lord. <clears throat> Repent, turn away from all your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. Notice the word of hope. Repent, turn away from all your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you've committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. What a word of hope. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Can we pray this morning? Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that with every temptation, your word declares you make a way of escape so that we can bear up under it and that, Father, as our hearts turn back to you, it's not about running away from our sin. It's having it wiped out in the presence of the Lord so that times of refreshing can come. Lord, I just sense that there are so many people living lives of regret because of decisions that have been made without genuine repentance working in the midst of that. Experiencing sorrow that triggers depression, emotional problems because we get trapped, we get stuck. Father, worldly sorrow triggering shame in our life or a sense of injustice, even rage, which is just unchecked shame. And here you've made a way to allow that sorrow to work in our life, but to produce incredibly positive results. And Father, I pray that we would just sense this morning how powerful, genuine repentance is in our life and how consistently it needs to be practiced and how we need to recover the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and then our response to that. Repenting of things, situations, circumstances, decisions, sin not in a religious sense that we have to because it's so powerful when we read in your word Lord that it's your kindness that leads us to repentance as your prophets declared hundreds of years before Jesus came with a message of repentance that it wasn't your will your desire that anybody die and perish repent and live and so Lord I pray that where we find death working in us that we would turn to God and do the same thing. This morning, genuinely turn from it, repent of it, and live.
that we would walk out that life in the salvation that you promised us through your son, Jesus. And that, Father, the benefit of that would be that we could live a life of no regrets. Father, I ask for every person this morning, just open their heart to you. And I ask that you would help us to see and define in our own hearts where we've responded to that sorrow in a worldly way with the focus on ourselves rather than a godly way with the focus on him. That Lord, you take this simple message that I feel like is just so timely from you and that you would help us to see, Lord, that you have not come to condemn the world but that through you, the world might be saved. And how we do is turn our hearts back to you. We open our hearts to you. We get a new heart. We get a new spirit and we repent so that we can live. I wanna take time to minister to some folks this morning and I realize that it could be awkward. So not calling anybody out. We're not saying, okay, you need to repent saying if there's areas of your life and you realize that you've responded inappropriately to the sorrow that you've experienced regardless of the level of sin that could be judgment that could be unforgiveness that could be something with legal ramifications that could be something that even our society just ah that's no big deal that's not even really a sin you know, it's little white lies, everybody lies, and there's great big black lies. Those are bad, but these aren't. And that we put our lives on this scale, but what we experience is not the abundance of life that Jesus came that we could have. And this morning, you just make a decision for that, and you turn your heart to God, and you say, there's an area of my life where the Lord's dealing with me, and I just need to repent of that. What you do is respond to God with those words exactly. I'm sorry in this area of my life, in my heart. And so Lord, I repent. It's the same process that we go through to restore relationships with others. It's not just being sorry. It's taking action in that sorrow and saying, so I repent to you. I change, I turn away from that and I turn back to you. I open my heart to you. I want to restore relationship with you. We can do that with our children. We can do that with our spouses. We can do that with brothers and sisters in Christ. And we can do that with people in the world that don't even know what we're talking about. But the result is powerful and effective. Before we take that step, it's just taking a step to God and saying, Lord, I, I want you to work in my life. I want to understand the effects of that sorrow and I want it to produce genuine repentance in my heart, the actions of that. Father, I want it to be the salvation that you've promised me and I want to be in a place that I'm able to look back and say, this leaves no regret. I don't regret the repentance. I don't regret humbling myself. I don't regret turning to the Lord. I don't regret finding that in your word. Lord, I don't regret the effort that it took to make things right. I don't regret all the time that passed because your work is full and complete. And what you restore, you restore fully and completely. So Father, I ask for every heart this morning just to take time to respond to you. God, to find that place in our heart where we make those decisions and we ask you, as David did, search my heart, Lord, and see if there are offensive ways in me, things in my heart. Fathers, we bring it. We bring it to you in genuine repentance and we say, I turn away from this thing. Father, if there's areas of our life that have produced regret, maybe this morning that we're experiencing that all over again, but we're bringing it back and what you're revealing to us is what you long to heal. And so Lord, we open our hearts to you in repentance and rest is our salvation. In quietness and trust 
is our strength. Father, things that we've wrestled with rather than rested in are things we just need to turn from, repent and establish ourselves in you. Rest in God and find our trust in you. God, I pray this morning that as we do, as we take that time to pray, as we take that time to minister, that your Holy Spirit would just do an awesome work among us. In Jesus' name. Heads bowed and eyes closed all over the building. And you just say, Pastor, there's an area of my life where I recognize that. And this morning, God's dealing with me. And so I'm making that decision to repent of that thing, to turn from it. That I'm here, first of all, confessing that before the Lord. And then confessing it one to another in a body of believers. Come on, lift your hands all over the building and say, I'm responding to the Lord this morning. I'm responding to what he's doing in my heart, the Holy Spirit, the conviction, the sorrow. Hands up all over the building. Come on, others of you. Hallelujah. There's no shame. There's no regret. Don't regret leaving this morning feeling that you got to keep a secret, feeling that you got to be separated or that you're the only one. Listen, all of us are there. My hands up. My heart's open before God. Because as we walk with him, there's things God wants to restore. There's things God wants to establish. And there's things in my life that I want to remove because I want to live a life of no regrets in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Those that lifted your hands, would you stand with me? Come on, all over the building. That's fine. That's awesome. We're going to pray together. I, I want you to know I'm the first one standing this morning. Not because I'm standing up to preach. I'm also standing up for the altar call. And I realize I've had a head start on you this week because God's been dealing with me. And before God brings a message through us, he works the message in us. And so I've looked at areas of my life, situations in my relationship even with Kim, with my kids, with my church. And that word has just been restored in my vocabulary strongly. That there are areas that God's laid on my heart where I need to write a note, where I need to connect with somebody, where I just need to take the high road and be the one to say, listen, this has created sorrow in me and God's just brought this back. And here's how I wanna to respond to that. I wanna repent. And I want there to be a salvaging here of relationship, trust, life, whatever it is. And I want us to be in a place where there's no regrets. How many of you? Amen. Those of you that are standing all over, would you just lift your hands to the Lord and receive from him? Repentance starts with turning away from whatever it is and turning to God. So now if there's someone standing around you with their hands up, would you join them? Come on, we'll just initiate everybody in the prayer team this morning. Would you just stand and put a hand on somebody? Amen, here's a couple back here, others of you. Some here in the middle, some of my sisters, would you just gather around those? And let's just take some time to minister to one another. Can I just lead us in prayer? Holy Spirit, I just thank you. We just wanna cooperate with what you're doing. Because Lord, we realize that we can initiate that in people's life and it can only create offense. But what you do, and Father, when we come alongside, just cooperate with what you've already initiated. There's a powerful connection that begins to take place. So Lord, I thank you that not only is forgiveness ours, Father, regret can just break off of our life. Father, that sense of living in remorse, living beneath what you promised and where, where you've established us. God, that you can take away shame off of our lives and that, that sense of keeping secrets and that, Lord, you can have honor established and let your confidence shine through our face. Lord, I pray right now that we would see the key of breaking addictions that we would see the key to restoring relationships, we would see the key to no regret living is this simple act of repentance and turning back to God, turning away from those things and realizing that you don't put us in a headlock, you don't force it, Lord, you lead us in your kindness, you lead us in your compassion, 
You lead us to a place of healing and forgiveness. When our hearts turn towards you, you're already turned toward us. So Lord, I pray this morning that salvation would come into lives that have struggled to live this thing in God. Felt like they were unsuccessful in their Christian walk. Felt like they were second class and removed from what God wanted to do. Felt like they weren't good enough to share with others about God's goodness in their lives. Father, this morning I pray that you'd establish it in their heart and that you would flow through them with power. Father, that as they repent this morning and turn to you, they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise of your power would begin to rest on their life that they're not walking in worldly sorrow, trying to do it their own way, but they're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And God, the fruit of that Spirit would begin to manifest in their lives. And then as we look back, Father, we look at this moment as a time of change and transformation in our life because repentance brings us to a place of salvation and leaves no regret. Thank you for it, Lord. We receive it from you as we rejoice in you this morning, in Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah. And those that are gathered around, you may take just a minute if you have a word or prayer that you wanna speak over somebody's life. Would you just take a moment to do that? It's a powerful thing to be in community. It's a powerful thing to be in relationship. Let's just take a moment and see what God's doing here. Just lifting our hearts to him in worship while we continue to minister and pray for one another. Can we do that?